This video is part of a History Guild project looking at Australians in the Mediterranean during World War II. Uh, check out more articles, podcasts and videos examining this area at historyguild.org, link in the description below. Uh, the History Guild is a not-for-profit that works to improve historical knowledge. Thank you very much for their cooperation on this. In the aftermath of World War I, the nascent Royal Australian Navy underwent a radical reorganisation. Previously centred around the battle cruiser HMAS Australia and with ambitions to further development, the Washington Naval Treaty and other factors would lead to a radical downsizing. Whilst some of this would later be recovered in the form of the county class HMAS Australia and HMAS Canberra and the Leander class HMASs Perth, Hobart and Sydney, on the smaller scale, the Royal Australian Navy would receive the destroyers Stalwart, Success, Swordsman, Tasmania, and Tattoo, along with the destroyer leader HMS Anzac, all by the leader being S-class destroyers of late World War I vintage. So they were pretty new and modern, all things considered, in the early 1920s. However, by the early 1930s, these vessels were getting a bit old and worn, and so they were to be replaced by five new ships from the Royal Navy's inventory in 1933 with the older ships then being sold a few years later for scrapping and other uses. Well, I say new. New in the sense of had not previously flown the Royal Australian Navy flag before and therefore was new to that particular service. The vessels in question, the destroyer leader HMAS Stewart and four V&W class destroyers, the Vampire, Vendetta, Voyager and Waterhen, were all roughly contemporary with the ships that had just been replaced placed by them, and they hadn't exactly been idle in the intervening time serving with the Royal Navy. All that could really be said for them was that they were at least a little bit more capable than their predecessors, as the S-Class had mounted three 4-inch guns and four to six torpedoes on a thousand ton displacement, roughly speaking, whilst the V&Ws were a hundred tons heavier, this extra displacement buying an extra 4-inch gun, two triple torpedo launchers, and a 1.5 knot increase in speed to a maximum of 34 knots. The destroyer leader also had the same increase in torpedo armament, but the main battery went from four single 4-inch to five single 4.7-inch. By the start of 1939, Stuart and Waterhen were in the reserves, but as war clouds gathered over Europe, they were reactivated with September 1939 seeing all five setting out across the Indian Ocean for destinations unknown once war was declared. The Australian ships were obviously led by the Stuart, whose captain engendered a great deal of loyalty from his crew. Max Middleton had been assigned to the Stuart in the days following the outbreak of war, and he gives a bit more explanation. We got back in and I found that I had been drafted to a ship with the war being on, it was about the second day of the war, and I had been drafted to a ship, but because I wasn't there, someone else was sent, and uh, which disgusted me, of course. Um, I think a week later I was sent to join uh, HMAS Stewart. She was a flotilla leader of the V&Ws, later called a scrap iron flotilla and we had as our captain that time and captain d was commander heck waller one of the most famous of our skippers um, one of the most well a man you'd walk <laughs> walk through coals for he was a he had really nothing in um, outstanding his manner and his ability to command was just beyond anyone else I ever saw in the Navy brilliant captains that we had he engendered uh, loyalty to a point of almost fanaticism and so we uh, about four of us joined the ship how, how did he how did he gain that loyalty so fiercely? Well, it was just his his uh, unruffled manner. No matter no matter what went on, no matter how 
desperate the situation, he had the same calm voice. He had the ability to cut to the kernel of any problem uh, if there was, well, later in the Mediterranean under uh, under Admiral, Admiral Cunningham with the fleet, and the fleet at that stage consisted of five battleships, about 15 cruisers, and I think 30 destroyers, plus sundry tenders, submarines and all that type of thing. But before a fleet sweep, all the captains would be called on board, senior captains, uh, in actual fact, in our case, Captain D. Uh, and um, in Cunningham's memoirs, he wrote how after at a briefing of a fleet sweep, the inevitable end would come and there'd be any questions. And Cunningham said, I'd immediately turn and wait for, uh, or then he became a captain later, Captain Waller, to put his finger on the weakest and sorest section of the whole of the sweep. And he had that ability to disseminate information but uh, discard anything superfluous and this seemed to show in his personality from uh, the moment you spoke to him. He wasn't a handsome man but he was a man's man. This sailing was a significant commitment Every single one of the Royal Australian Navy's destroyers had left home waters, arriving a few days later at Singapore, where they engaged with Royal Navy vessels and Royal Navy submarines in anti-submarine warfare training, a skill that would prove quite vital in the forthcoming years. Then uh, we were out in the main, we were out uh, uh, carrying out Aztec searches for this British submarine. And uh, in Singapore, in, out from Singapore, off from Singapore, yeah. So that the guys on board who'd be listening out would know how to track a submarine, how to how to find one, and then track it, and uh, uh, something completely alien to them at the time. They knew of uh, by training, approximately, and they'd have sometimes sound, but then to hear it with the real thing was stood them in very good stead later, worked worked very well. Uh, we had a good Aztec crew on board. And um, Was that, excuse me for interrupting Max, but was that in tandem with the Royal Navy? Oh yeah. So they would uh, su support you by giving you the British submarine to track and... Well we were Royal Navy at the time. Well, they were Australian Navy. We were only flying a white ensign. We weren't flying the Australian uh, white ensign as we have now. And so there's no distinguishing characteristics other than uh, as one senior Royal Naval officer said, uh, uh, we will always know you from your piratical rig. And the piratical rig that we wore, of course, was anything that suited the situation, whereas they had to wear uniforms. Uh, our guys would front up with footy shorts and singlets, whatever. And, uh, yeah, they didn't like that in the RN. With this new information imparted, and of course the traditional Australian disregard for uniform regulations, the fleet sailed again on the 13th of November, arriving on the 18th in Colombo in Ceylon, which is now Sri Lanka. Here was where the first potential taste of action was to be had. A freighter, the Africa Shell, was reported to have been attacked and sunk in the Indian Ocean by a German raider. Rumour varied between whether it was the Deutschland or the Graf Spee. In actual fact, it was the latter. But almost immediately, the Australian sailors began devising a strategy to use if they were called into action. This consisted, according to the most popular votes, of stringing out a search line, which would then, once the raider was found, gather in and shadow the ship until the sun had set, staying out of its main gun range. 
Then, all the ships would rush in from all directions at once and deliver an overwhelming torpedo assault from which there could be no escape. Perhaps somewhat fortunately for the Germans, the Graf Spee soon left the area and would eventually meet her fate at the hands of Exeter, Achilles and Ajax in the South Atlantic, and so the intrepid five destroyers found themselves sailing through the sweltering Red Sea, up the Suez Canal and into the Mediterranean where they became the 19th Destroyer Division. Upon hearing of the arrival of the small Australian force, the German propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels, referred to them as another consignment of scrap iron from Australia, and gave them the derisive nickname the Scrap Iron Flotilla. As with many other things that Goebbels said, the men that he insulted seemed to have taken it as a personal mission to prove him wrong in subsequent events. The opening stages of the ship's operations were relatively calm. The Marine Nationale and the Royal Navy were both on hand, plus the war was at that point only against Germany, which had essentially zero presence in the Mediterranean. This afforded precious time to gain sea experience in what was to be the flotilla's crucible. Vampire went in for a refit in March, while Stuart was sent out looking for a broken-down tanker, the Trochus. It then found her, and since the seas were rising and the tug that had been called for was nowhere in sight, decided to salvage the ship herself. After five hours of snapping line after snapping line, something strong enough was eventually secured, and the destroyer began a walking pace journey back to Malta with the ship in tow, the first salvage and rescue effort for the Royal Australian Navy of the war, but far from the last. Eventually, the embattled tug out of Valletta arrived and formed up, but it was too foggy to risk transferring the lines, and so Stuart soldiered on with the tug shadowing until, eventually, visibility improved and the tow was handed over. But the situation in Europe began to get significantly worse. In the Mediterranean, this meant that the 19th Destroyer Division was merged with the 20th to become the 10th Destroyer Flotilla. And then, in mid-June, Italy entered the war which would be followed almost but not quite immediately by the fall of France. Italian light forces were both numerous and well trained, but Admiral Cunningham proved popular with the crews of his ships by both his actions and his attitude, which could be summed up as attack whenever possible, something that suited the Australians quite well. Ian MacDonald had been serving on HMAS Sydney, but would now be transferred to HMAS Stewart, and he recalls... The Navy was and still is a British Navy, well all navies I think are similarly divided. There, there are officers and there are sailors. Um, the officers are bracketed in a group called the upper deck and the others are lower deck. So if you're a lower deck man you're a sailor of some sort from ordinary something, ordinary um, say, ordinary stoker, ordinary, say, ordinary seaman, ordinary Sigelman, ordinary, whatever, up to chief yeoman, chief petty officer. But that is the, the hierarchy level of the lower deck. When you get a commission, you jump from lower deck up to upper deck, where you begin as, well, a young, young fellow would begin as a midshipman or a warrant officer and go through, say, to sub-lieutenant, lieutenant, lieutenant commander, up, up, up to admiral of the fleet. But they're upper deck, lower deck. And there's a distinct difference. Uh, in our day, it was much more pronounced than it is today. I mean, in our day, uh, if a captain came round, you scuttled out of the way because he was God. But nowadays, the sailor's likely to call him Bill. That's yeah, interesting hierarchy. Mm. So going back to um, your, your uh, mission to uh, the Mediterranean... Uh -huh. So um, we'll go back to when you were sailing out of Australia. How, how were you, um, what were your, your duties as you were sailing out of? Well, simply getting there first. Uh, I, yes, we, I think we, we went on our own. We, we were called, the, the British said, please send us another cruiser. The Australian Navy said, fine, you can have Sydney. So Sydney hot-footed it, boom, uh, flat foot to Singapore, to Aden, up in through the Red Sea into the Mediterranean, to Alexandria, with a wonderful concert at Aden. We all sat on the open deck in the bright, bright moonlight, the red moon of it comes over Aden, and we had a wonderful concert where the, the troops all sang their bits and the guy who played a guitar would sing and so on. Uh, 
We got into the Mediterranean and uh, we simply joined the British Mediterranean Eastern Fleet, or the British Eastern Mediterranean Fleet under Sir Admiral Cunningham, one of the very best sailors of all time. Why was he so good? He was a brilliant admiral for a start, a brilliant fleet man. He'd begun as, as a destroyer captain where uh, all the best sailors seemed to come from destroyer captains. Um, up through to, to become Admiral, but he was a lovely man. Um, there's a lovely story about him. He was just a little fellow, uh, and, he, and one night we were, well, a group, I wasn't with them, but we had little motorboats that brought our fellows back from leave ashore in Alexandria, back to our ships, and the one night uh, at the jetty, along came a little man in civvies, and he said, excuse me, could you guys give me a list, lift? Uh, he wouldn't have said guys, he would have said men. Uh, well, fellows, can you fellows give me a, a lift back to Warspite, the, the Admiral's battleship? And they said, sure, mate, jump aboard. We're going past her. So this little man jumped aboard and the ship, the motorboat, set off for the Warspite. And as they came aboard Warspite, they see there was panic aboard Warspite because in this, this little man was Sir Admiral Sir Andrew Cunningham, the Admiral of the Fleet. But he was that sort of guy. And I served also with Heck Waller aboard Stuart, and he was that sort of man also. Wonderful man. So how did I get with Waller? Well, the, immediately we got to the Mediterranean. Um, Stuart, with Heck Waller in, in command of the what was called the 10th Destroyer Flotilla, which c contained all of the Australian destroyers, Come back to them. They were short of a signalman. So they said, OK, Sydney, have you got any spare signalman? And they said, well, McDonald's no bloody good, send him. Uh, <laughs> so I finished up aboard Stuart immediately almost. Uh, so I didn't serve in the Mediterranean in Sydney. I missed the, the great Bartolomeo Colleone battle for that reason. I think I might have sailed up the coast and bombarded Bardia with them, but I but that's about all I did in Sydney. I went to destroyers. And that's a very different life to being aboard a cruiser. As the conflict entered this new stage, Malta was almost immediately attacked and Vendetta got a front row seat to a modern aerial bombardment. Whilst her crew got to reply with the ship's limited anti-aircraft guns, whilst also arming themselves against possible parachute landings. Stewart was the first to see action at sea, discovering and then marking a trio of submarine-laid minefields before letting loose with rifle fire to destroy as many as possible, because these mines happened to be the type that floated on the surface. Captain Waller's discovery method of edging the destroyer through and around each minefield probably took a few years off the crew's collective lives thanks to the stress, though. Both Stewart and Voyager then began hunting for the submarine responsible, with Voyager getting a lead and following it for most of the day. Night fell, and then finally, in the darkness, a solid contact was established on Asdic. Three depth charge runs eventually brought a submarine to the surface. Voyager believed it to be sunk after a barrage of gunfire, but on the other hand, Italian records don't seem to record the loss of any vessel on this date. It's possible it was damaged, though. That wasn't to deter Voyager, though, as within a month she'd helped sink the Console Generale Luisi and the Uebi Schibelli, the training from Singapore having been put to good use in the confirmed sinking of these two submarines. More patrols and more attacks on submarine contacts followed, but the first of a number of bombardment missions against Bardia proved to be a useful distraction if you'd gotten bored of hunting subs. This initial mission also included participation from the Marine Nationale in the form of the battleship Lorraine, since it fell in the narrow window between the Italian entry into the war and the French surrender. Once the capital ships and the cruisers were safely in place and merrily blasting away, the destroyers then sneaked in for some closer broadsides of their own. Keith Young was present for those missions aboard HMAS Stewart. Uh, bombardment? Yes. The first bombardment was with the Lorraine. It was a, a French battleship with their crew, beautiful ships they had, cruisers, and just went over there and, and fired into Bardi, which was up on a very big hill. Or, or, and uh, that was it, went away. And then uh, later on, shortly after that, we went out with the three 
English battleships, cruisers, destroyers, that's when the French stopped, and, and that was the second one. Now after that, we were down there with the Terror, and she just there for months on end, and just fire one shot in every now and again, and every, get some information through from the army or something like that, and they, they might punch 20 or 30 rounds in. And then finally, uh, we'd occasionally do a bit of shooting along there, and then uh, occasionally they'd fire back. But then the final one, just before, that would be December probably, November, December 1940, the uh, three battleships came out with everybody to help them and they really pounded it. And the army went in and, well, I suppose they got shot at too, but uh, it stopped them. And uh, I said all those prisoners, 21. What do you, and what do you reckon you, I guess as a fleet, you were hoping to achieve before the army fellows went in? Well, we were uh, doing it together, uh, Army and Navy and Air Force, not not through us, but through the upper echelon. They chased it around and they knew about it. And they, our, probably, we probably knew that they were going to attack, so they went in first. We did the bombardment and then they went in. Uh, Army, I, I mentioned to Rita, Rita's brother one time that uh, the shells we fired were just weighed under a ton and uh, he had a friend there who was a, uh, uh, in the army, a, a sergeant who had been on in Sydney, the uh, guns there before the war, nine inch they were, and he laughed, he said it couldn't be a ton. So I went to work and brought the book home and showed him that the 15 inch were just under a ton and the 16 inch, which are battle cruisers, just weighed over a ton. So that was the difference. In the aftermath of all of this excitement, HMS Vampire took to sub-hunting as well, whilst Vendetta completed its refit and managed to make it away from Malta without any further damage. Vampire was then given her own baptism of fire under the bombs of the Regia Aeronautica, her lone pom-pom gun keeping up a steady, if somewhat hopeful, fire, whilst many of the rest of the crew came out onto deck with cameras, a few of them yelling at the bombers to come down lower, in order to afford both the gun crews and the photographers a better shot. Dozens of bombs splashed down near both Vampire and the convoy she was escorting, but nothing much was accomplished that day by the Italian pilots except for a lot of dead fish. In early June, the Mediterranean fleet left Alexandria for destinations unknown. Stuart, Vampire and Voyager were part of the escort, and they kept with Force A, one of three fleet elements that were conducting the sweep. Then, on the 9th, two days after leaving port, a swordfish from HMS Eagle reported the presence of Italian ships nearby, and the carrier then launched a strike. But the Italian ships evaded it. And so the British fleet closed in, the capital ships led by the mighty HMS Warspite, itself in turn screened by the destroyers, including the three Australian vessels. A cruiser fight up ahead heralded the start of the Battle of Calabria and Voyager was assigned together with Vampire to screen the Eagle, whilst Stuart kept company with Warspite. Both Ian MacDonald and Keith Young remember the battle. The battles, um, we fought in the battle, what was called the Battle of uh, Calab uh, yeah, Calabria, which was Calabria, Italy, where in our fleet, was led, led by the Warspite, a couple of other battleships who were very old, they travelled about, you know, eight knots a fortnight, one of them, Ramillies. And we were the lead destroyers, protecting all this fleet uh, with the Italian. We chased the Italians almost into Taranto. We would see Italy, both sides of us. We were right up in that Calabrian Bay, or whatever it's called. Um, and they, uh, suddenly we got a, a signal, right, destroyers go in and make a torpedo attack. So Stuart, as the leader of the 10th Flotilla, leads this heap of ships zooming in to go in and, and torpedo the Italian battleships. Uh, and at that stage, of course, we had a, a chief, a gunner mate on board who was a, had fought in the Battle of Jutland. So we're going in and he's saying, you know, we're up on the bridge and folks saying, what's it like? So we, well, at Jutland, the destroyers were going up like matchboxes. It's all thank you very much. Well, there were big shells landing all around us. 
and and I mean big ones, you know, they're 15 inch shells from the Italian battleships coming at us. And uh, they come with a great scream. And I, I guess I, uh, I don't know, I got scared, uh, but I thought I'd better hide. So I hid behind the, the railing of the wing of the deck, the flag deck. And I was crouched behind this thing and I looked at it and I thought, God, MacDonald, you bloody idiot, this is painted canvas. And I was hiding behind a painted canvas against 15 <laughs> shells. Now, from that moment, I didn't care. Once I thought, well, what a stupid bloody thing to do. What the hell? We weren't touched. Uh, we, we did. Oh, by the way, we, uh, destroyers running in then, signalmen are awfully busy because the, all the destroyers suddenly alter course together this way and then that way, dodging. Then they do this. And they're, they're weaving in and out, trying to get in as close to the enemy battleship as possible without being hit so that they can then turn and fire their torpedoes at close range. So a lot of dodging going on. Well, of course, dodging means lots of signals, flag signals, which means lots of hoisting of ropes, which means signals, signalmen's hands get sore. And my hands got burnt through the skin and they were raw. They were red raw. Now, I didn't feel that until afterwards in the excitement of all this. But I'm lipping, hoisting flags through raw flesh almost. And it took about a week for, my, for our hands to heal. And I was just one of half a dozen guys who were doing this. But, uh, Calabria, the Battle of Calabria, all I can remember was that uh, it was the first big action in the Mediterranean since Trafalgar, Nelson's day. Uh, we were taught the uh, two lines was V to R, van to rear. That's where the main ships were, and then the smaller ships up ahead, like the cruisers. And they were up there. In fact, we were up with them at one stage, and they opened fire when they met. They fired back at each other. We went back to the thing. Uh, just one of those things that there was shells flying around, and you could hear the 15-inch uh, shells going across over the top of us from our battleships. The difficulty was... We had uh, war spite could get up to about 24 knots. The Royal Sovereign and Malaya was still the old First World War. They hadn't been reconditioned. Could only get 14 knots, so they couldn't catch up with them. With the enemy, uh, war spite grabbed two destroyers and took off at high speed, and she was able to hit them. And then the the aircraft coming over and dropping, but we were busy. Uh, he sent in three lots of uh, destroyers, put the V and W's look after the aircraft carrier and sent us in with uh, torpedo attack. It was a beautiful sunny day, unbelievable to see these three lines of ships going in and we were busy hoisting flags and what have you and uh, we, we were firing, we got a few shells nearby and as far as we know it was a possibility we hit one of their destroyers. They lost the destroyer and uh, damaged the cruiser. We did. We uh, damaged a battleship, but we uh, they called us back because they put a big smoke screen up and were one, they'd be probably waiting. And they called the uh, destroyers back and retreated. We were bombed for all next day and things like that. But uh, no, they just didn't hit because they were very high. Stuart came under attack from Italian cruisers, as it seemed that every ship from small destroyers through the cruisers and up to the battleships was engaging. When the hit to Giulio Cesare caused the Italians to break off the action, there was more fun for the Australian ships, as the Regia Aeronautica sent bombs raining down on them from above for a considerable portion of time thereafter. Still more bombs were in store for Voyager and Vampire. They were escorting convoys and the two destroyers were then subjected to a vicious series of night and day attacks, which did little damage to the ships, but did cause the first fatal casualty aboard a Royal Australian Navy vessel. Gunnar Endicott, from the Royal Navy, was wounded by splinters from a near-miss aboard Vampire, and would later pass away whilst undergoing treatment aboard HMS Mohawk. The Malta-based destroyers were also treated to the site of a French submarine, probably the Narval, which sailed into Malta to join the Free French forces, where, in which she would serve until her loss later in the year. The rest of the summer months and the early autumn was spent with the ships split up and carrying out a range of missions, 
mostly convoy escort, with the occasional bombardment thrown in, plus some slightly odder missions. Vendetta and Vampire, for example, went with the cruiser HMS Orion to form a decoy force, the idea being to draw the attention of an Italian convoy's escorts, which would allow another separate ambushing force to make straight for the merchant ships unmolested. Bardia was the perennial subject of attention for Stuart and Waterhen, but by this point poor old Stuart had been run so heavily she was in desperate need of a refit. The only problem was that there was an even more desperate need for her services, and so September crept by and she was still being sent hither and yon all over the Mediterranean, and during this time she ran into another submarine. Arnold Coleman was aboard her at the time. You said the torpedoes go at 22 knots. What speed was the Stuart? What speed did she have? Oh, she was about 30 knots. She was flat out. It wouldn't do, I don't think she'd do much more because the, the steam pipes wouldn't couldn't hold hang on, hang in there. But, uh, that's where she came to grief at the Matapan, I believe. The broke a steam pipe. They were always breaking the damn thing. And uh, that's how we come to get the that uh, submarine I was telling you about. If we broke a steam pipe, we were travelling with the fleet, and we broke a steam pipe, so they sent us back to, to Alex, and we had to cruise back at whatever speed we could manage, and that's where we picked up this submarine laying the bloody mind. Uh, all things happen. <laughs> Did you actually shoot upon the submarine that particular day, or...? No. What were the oh, circumstances? They, they opened fire with the pom-poms, uh, uh, but they didn't open fire with the bigger guns. Because she was on her way down, they pulled the plug when as soon as they, the skipper comes out, he pulls the plug and sends her to, to the bottom. It starts sinking, Fl floods the tanks and they all, she just goes to the bottom. That was after they come up, they had to come up to charge their batteries because we'd been sitting over them all night. They hadn't had a chance to come up and, and uh, charge their batteries. Uh, and they couldn't move on somewhere else? No, no. They couldn't because we were right behind them, well, just cruising along on top because they only do five or six knots underwater, the uh, the subs. But they're a lot faster than that now, all these, uh, uh, what do you call them, uh, the latest ones they got, they, they can travel at big speeds down below where they couldn't in the old days. Five or six, might be ten knots, that's about it. It's flat out. So the scenario... Yep. You're right. The scenario at that time with the, the submarine, you were returning home. Yeah. We got a ping with the Aztec here. We got a ping with the Aztec there and he, he checked it out. And so we started dropping depth charges. So on depth charges over. One of the, we, we was following him all the way along, but we didn't know he was dropping mines all the way. He was getting rid of the mines before we, we, we happened to hit the sh ship with a the submarine with a depth charge and blow the lot up. There was only one bloke drowned, come and swim, but he couldn't swim. So the rest of them left him for dead anyway. So two of our blokes went over to try and get him, but they missed, like, he was dead when they got him. So. This, as it turns out, was the Italian submarine Gondar, and after a journey back to Alexandria with the survivors, HMS Stewart was finally sent for a refit that would last until early 1942. Vampire, Voyager and Waterhen were now to be found frequently escorting the growing Royal Navy carrier forces in the region, their anti-aircraft armament gradually being augmented when a weapon or two could be found. With the Stuart in refit, Captain Waller had transferred to Vampire to continue leading from the front, and was treated to a spectator seat one night in October when HMS Ajax had a close run-in with a number of Italian torpedo boats, coming off the victor in explosive style, albeit not for lack of trying on the Italian's part, whilst Vampire played flank guard hunting submarine contacts that had appeared at around the same time. Around dawn, together with Vampire and the cruiser HMS York, Ajax crippled a full-size fleet destroyer, a larger encounter with Italian cruisers was avoided, in part due to shell damage to Ajax's bow from the earlier encounter, slowing her down. As 1940 began to draw to a close, the war extended to Greece, and so where the action was, there the Australian ships would follow. 
They missed out on escorting the Taranto strike force, Stuart was still refitting, Voyager, Vendetta and Warhound were escorting a convoy at the time, and Vampire had just got back into port and needed refueling and reloading, so they got to watch the battle force leave, but couldn't join. Instead, Vampire took a convoy to Suda Bay, and then joined up with Voyager to take another convoy to Malta, whilst Vendetta and Waterhen paired up to escort different convoys. Work continued in this vein as 1941 opened, which would also see Stuart return, and with it the coincidental return of full fleet operations. This was just in the nick of time. Numerous British ships were being hit as the Greek campaign intensified and the scrap iron flotilla was needed more than ever, shuttling into and out of Suda Bay on numerous escort missions, including one where Vampire was paradoxically saved by engine trouble the issues forcing her to drop to 12 knots, but this also meant that they were moving slowly enough that somebody managed to spot a mine that they otherwise would probably have run right into. Waterhen, meanwhile, was happily dodging bombs, and managed to rescue a tanker which had been hit by bombs and set on fire. The crew had abandoned ship, but after some time aflame, during which the tanker failed to explode, Waterhen's captain called for a volunteer crew, and after a long, hard fight all night, they managed not only to extinguish most of the fires, with 13,000 tonnes of oil sitting right beneath their feet, but they were also able to restart the engines and sail the ship using only the engines for steering, as the bomb hit had taken out the steering gear, amongst various other things. This vital load of fuel oil was then saved, and the tanker sailed into harbour with the fire hoses still playing onto the remaining small but stubborn fires. Then, on the 26th of March 1941, Voyager and Vampire set out escorting a convoy of slow ships carrying war material. Soon, Italian recon aircraft were spotted overhead, and the stage was set for the next major clash, Matapan. Stuart and Vendetta were with Cunningham's main fleet. The former, as at Calabria, stayed with the battleships, whilst the latter went off with Orion, four other cruisers, and the carrier Formidable. But her engines broke down, and she was left in the unenviable position of being all alone, barely making any steerage way, with the smoke of a rather large Italian fleet on the horizon. Luckily, the airstrikes launched by Formidable persuaded the Italians to be somewhere else. Stuart's crew, on the other hand, were left annoyed when a detachment of destroyers that didn't include them were sent off to find the ships that Formidable's pilots reported they'd hit. But, as it turned out, they were right where they needed to be. As the night wore on, what they didn't know was that Admiral Cunningham was leading his battleships and the remaining escorts right towards the last known enemy contact. Just after 2200, radar and visual spotting picked up the targets, and both Ian and Keith, who we've heard from earlier, were aboard Stuart and got to see the whole thing. The Battle of Matapan was a very different one. We'd, uh, the, 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 uh, of course, remember that we didn't know at the time, but um, the Enigma was well and truly uh, being used, um, so that Cunningham as Admiral almost knew from day, from hour to hour, what the enemy ships were doing. <coughs> and so, all of a sudden, uh, the signal goes round, we're all in Alexandria, fleet is proceeding to sea at what not, which what, destroyers do this, and so on and so that. Now, as a signalman, of course, you were in a position where you got, you read all this. Uh, the able sailor probably didn't know, he was just, you know, he was told he was going to sea. But we got the signal that told us, and so, we were in that fortunate position to understand a great deal of, of, the, of the strategies and the tactics, although we were just signalmen. Uh, so, OK, proceed to sea. So the whole fleet, first of all, the destroyers to clear the tracks, and the minesweepers to clear the way, the destroyers to make sure there aren't any submarines around and to lead and protect this great fleet as it goes to sea. By the way, I talk about a great fleet, but the Yanks later would say, what, that little group of ships? Well, we had fleets, and they did. They had massive fleets. But at our stage, this was a great fleet. Um, so off we went to... The, we knew the Italian fleet was out. They very rarely came out, uh, because they were heading to Greece or somewhere. And Cunningham decided to get behind them and, and, and cap, literally cut them off and destroy them. So off we went. Uh, 
Perth cruiser was in the van of that battle and fired lots of shots at the Italians during the day, but they were perhaps 20 mile ahead of us because we were stayed to protect the battleships, hard alongside the battleships. Came nightfall and Cunningham said, well, you don't take battleships into battles at night. You get them to hell out of the way. They are too slow and vulnerable. So all, all you fast cruisers and fast modern destroyers, you go in and get the Italians, and I with the vulnerable, slow old battleships and these old has-been destroyers like Stuart, we will retire. What they didn't know, <laughs> that the, we ran into the Italians, <laughs> smack bang into the middle of them. <laughs> so we're cruising happily along, quietly along in this night, and all of a sudden, uh, our chief, Yeoman, spotted the Italian fleet, spotted a, some ships. And of course, you got good at spotting ships at night. We spotted these ships, the alarm went out quickly, uh, a great searchlight came out from the war spite, and I gather the searchlight was lit by no less, by no less a person than the prince. Uh, he was the searchlight midshipman or sub-lieutenant on the searchlight. And... The searchlight lit out on the first magnificently beautiful, the Italian ships were gorgeous, they were beautiful ships. Searchlight, 15 inch guns from Warspite, boom, boom, like an atomic bomb explosion and away goes this beautiful Italian cruiser, bang, or ship, whatever it was. And they shift to the next in line, but of course Cunningham immediately says, right, battleships get the hell out of this. We can't afford to have you staying in. So they get the hell out of it. And he says, right, oh, Stuart, Greyhound, I think, uh, and two H's, Hyperion, so and so. You guys go in now, now and clean them up. So we go in the middle of this Italian fleet and we spent an hour and a half doing exactly that. What did you think when you got that, uh, when you received that? Order? Oh, we thought that was great. <laughs> we, <laughs> we're going in to have a bash at them. Great. <laughs> um, so we, and of course, we were cruising, you know, in this, I, I've got a chart of that in, in my story there. Um, and we spent an hour and a half going in and out around all these ships and bashing anything we could see. Uh, and even at one stage, we were cruising quite fast along with our eye on the ship over here, when all of a sudden, no more than a hundred or so yards ahead of us, crosses a beautiful Italian destroyer at full speed coming down here. Um, and she comes down this side. Now, again, you have to understand that a signalman in a battle like that, you know, he feels so bloody useless because what has a signalman got to do? Who's he going to signal to and what's he going to do? So you sit there thinking, oh, God, you, I'm all frustrated. <laughs> I'm not in this bloody war. It's, it's other people's war. But fortunately, they did teach us how to... We had twin Lewis guns on, on the bridge, wings of our bridge and they did teach us how to fire these things and we did, in fact, occasionally shoot at a, a dive bomber or something, but you never got close enough to a ship to shoot with a Lewis gun. But on this occasion, there's this bomb and destroyer a hundred or so yards away and the coxswain who's inside said, who's that out there? And I said, me. Well, he said, well, me, for Christ's sake, get on that bloody Lewis gun and shoot the bastards. But, but of course, that's what Lewis guns are for. Right, so I start these Lewis guns and I fire, I shoot this bloody destroyer as it goes on 100 yards away. So that was, by the way, my only really, no, no, later on, I'm wrong. That was in the med thing, that was my only positive, aggressive action. I was a signalman. Uh, a little late later, we had the, our other greyhound, I think she was, astern of us. A little later, Heck Waller signals to greyhound, what did you do with that destroyer, sunk her? <laughs> torpedo, of course. Um, well, that, the Battle of Matapan, and so, okay, that, of course, to us was a great and glorious thing. We had come through this quite large battle at that stage. Later in the war, of course, there were much bigger battles. How but many it, ships were you up against with the Italians? Oh, a dozen. I so, can't remember, but a, let's say a dozen. You some. were outnumbered? Oh, God, yes. 
Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, and so, okay, and so this was, you know, this was quite a thing that had happened. And, and we were naturally quite uh, ex exalted by that. We'd scored a, a, literally a great victory, as the, the poem said, you know, there was a famous victory and we were part of it. And so we went on our way then back to, we had to, we were withdrawn, uh, Cunningham sent us a signal, right, get out, you've done your job, get back out. Mattapan, uh, they were out and they, the, uh, we had three be, uh, modern uh, battleships then, there was Warspite, uh, Queen Elizabeth and Barham. Well, Barham was the only one that had uh, radar. And, but he'd sent our destroyers out at dusk looking for the enemy. They knew this, there were battleships and things there. And we just cruised along and we ran into these cruisers and destroyers. Barham picked them up with uh, her radar and the first thing that we knew, knew about it was we spotted them and reported them uh, by signal. And uh, the first thing we knew, they just... Uh, threw a searchlight on and blew one of them to pieces. Shocking! They didn't know. They never, they never did any damage. And I think it was four or five cruisers and several destroyers we destroyed that night. Did you see it? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah what we, was it like? Oh, mainly <coughs> the flashing. We were firing at a cruiser, and when they, were, I was down after on the quarter deck. They sent me down after once again. I take it my turn. And uh, they went up and turned and, and fired the <coughs> torpedoes at this burning cruise and one got in between and they hit that. And then uh, we were firing at the burning cruiser and another ship came down alongside us. It'll be about where the road is here, close, <coughs> silhouetted against the burning cruiser. And they tell me that on the bridge, the captain said, there's a destroyer, a signalman reported it, he said, how many funnels did it have? Only one. Well, all ours have got two, so it must be a baddie. So they just blew it to pieces. <coughs> and I was down aft, they put two broadsides into it. And the last two shells were the thing. I've got a photo I took in there. I just took it like that of the photo of the flash of the X gun. And it's, just, it's, not, <coughs> it's not a photo, it's just a blur, but you can see the sailors. And, and then the ship behind us, put a torpedo into it. Yeah, and they were, they, uh, uh, we were being, uh, what they call, what's that? Uh, well, surrounded you know, by either <laughs> side, the shells were straddling us, being, being straddled. And uh, when they fired at this, we were being straddled, it was shells landing either side of us when we fired on that destroyer. Then the, we had single barrel both our uh, pom pom guns on either side, which I told you about before, and they were so old and so thing that they threw them over the side and, and down along the western desert, the, the Italians had what they call a breeder gun, which was a, about an inch shell, you know, like a big machine gun. So they brought those aboard and put one either side of the the ship where the other guns were and one of our, uh, we found out that all the, uh, they fired sh shells with uh, coloured, red, blue uh, and white uh, for, and they were all firing them and w one of our, the boat that manned when we fired on this destroyer he opened fire with it. And this other cruiser that was firing at us stopped firing because he thought we were an Italian. That's what we think he thinks because he stopped firing because they, they used it as some sort of a recognition signal. But we happen to have two on board. They also, as Keith intimated, had a somewhat lucky escape. As Max recounts during part of his recollection on the slowly improved state of the Stuart's anti-aircraft defences. I was uh, the three-inch gun crew um, we had one three-inch anti-aircraft gun, anti gun on the Stuart. None of the other ships had, none of the other destroyers had. It was on a, a tower, on a fairly high tower, and uh, as a anti-aircraft. Um, so I wasn't 
in main gunnery, I was more interested and my interest was showing in the torpedo branch. So in torpedo branch you don't fire torpedoes when there's, a, when there's an aircraft attack. So you fill the anti-aircraft crews. And uh, so I was part of the three inch gun crew. Um, then underwater attack, part of the uh, depth charge crew. And uh, later on, they inadvertently found at, uh, in Malta, we were sure and we had, uh, we went on the range, the firing ranges there. The first time we'd all been on firing ranges, right throughout the war. And somehow um, I could handle the uh, machine guns, um, apparently slightly better than anybody else. And uh, so I became an uh, anti-aircraft machine gun from there on. There's either twin Lewis on each wing of the bridge or, or uh, and a Vickers down aft. And, uh, and the pom-poms, we had twin, uh, just single barrel pom-poms, just two on each side and the brake down on the iron deck. They were shocking things because they didn't take the wet weather very much and uh, so just constant jamming <clears throat> to a point where when we first took to Brook, first time we uh, the troops took to Brook, we were allowed to take two breeder guns, Italian breeder guns, there was so much ammunition left behind, it was, so we just ammunition with breeder ammunition, uh, put the pom poms down below out of sight, mounted the breeder guns, which were magnificently reliable, and uh, oh, they're a beautiful weapon. And uh, well, they saved our lives at one stage. In the Battle of Matapan, we steamed between two cruisers which happened to be Italian cruisers, and we're quite convinced of the fact that we'd fired the breeders each side and they could see the multi-tracers, so each of the cruisers able to fire on each other, thinking that each other one was an Italian. That was enemy, because the breeders and the Italian um, tracers were multicoloured. We only had single tracers in ours, just the way one trace of it. They had these multi-coloured traces. It looked rather pretty when they were firing. But, uh, but the mere fact that we carried out the torpedo attack and fired each side, and each had seen the ammunition and, and concluded that it was uh, an Italian destroyer firing on the ship so they opened fire on each other. Uh, so we got out of it there, because I don't think we'd have lasted very much with two eight inch cruisers, or heavy cruisers they were. Pretty sure they were eights, it could have been sixes. Who cares? They were big. Those anti-aircraft guns would be well needed in the coming months, as the tide of war turned against the Allies in Greece, and then subsequently when German paratroopers came for it, Crete. One officer aboard Vampire recalled the following. He said, there were 15 ships with us, and they included everything from troopers to tankers. We didn't have a great deal of ACAC stuff, and as it was to be a slow convoy of about six knots, we weren't sorry when the ACAC cruiser Carlisle joined the second day out. But she seemed to bring trouble with her, because the fun started almost immediately. We could hear the aircraft, but couldn't see them for the clouds, and as they roared overhead for about half an hour without us sighting them, we began to hope that perhaps they hadn't seen us either but they certainly had. We heard them go into their power dives, but it seemed ages before they broke through the clouds right above us. They were Junkers 88s and they were screaming. We threw everything but the anchor at them and Carlisle was putting up a magnificent barrage. Her four inch, multiple pom-poms and lighter weapons poured out such a hail of fire that it seemed impossible that the Huns could get through. But they broke off their dives just below the level of the clouds, let go their bombs and scurried back to cover. The bombs fell very wide, thank goodness. They gave us a rest then, but returned at about 6.30. The clouds had cleared, and we could see the planes as they came in from five different directions, all Yunkers 88s. It was great fun, I don't think. All our guns were blazing, for the planes were very low, 
The vampire starboard breeder hit one of the machines in three places. Its port engine sputtered and stopped. The plane circled around out of range as if the pilot had been hit and then left. I don't think it got back home. Bombs were dropping all around by now and giant columns of spray and water sometimes hid the convoy. But the planes had to retire when it got dark and the convoy gathered together again and went on. We entered the Aegean the next day, and at 10am the Italians took over from their Axis partners. Torpedo bombers approached, letting their fish go as soon as they were in range. They were lucky too. A tanker was hit amidships and Vampire went over to assist. But the tanker's crew stayed aboard, and I believe they reached port at Suda Bay. Vampire was also present for the last big evacuation convoy from Piraeus. Once this was safely away, she returned to help a small follow-on convoy that was escorted by the remnants of the Greek and Yugoslav navies, and subsequent German attacks on Vampire proving to the detriment of the Luftwaffe, who lost at least two bombers trying to sink the small but valiant ship. Stuart and Voyager showed up, fresh from commando-carrying missions off North Africa, helping move a few smaller convoys, groups of three or four ships, away from Greece in the face of ever-increasing opposition, as well as aiding in the direct evacuation of troops and nurses from various Greek harbours, which now had to be done at night to try and provide some shelter from the constantly circling dive bombers. This latter operation led to an odd circumstance wherein Voyager found itself making for safety when another air attack developed. Trying to skirt the fast-firing anti-aircraft cruiser Calcutta, a number of Junkers 88s made for the Voyager, which suddenly turned out to have developed quite a lot of teeth, the German aircraft diving into a blizzard of Bren gun fire, as it seemed that almost every soldier brought aboard had managed to bring at least one of them with them, and with the nurses running ammunition resupply, a hail of bullets caused the bombers to hesitate and then break off their assault, and thus the ship reached Crete safely without suffering any losses. Stuart, Vendetta, Vampire and Waterhen were also all getting stuck into similar covert extractions, having to fight off daily torpedo bomber attacks which were usually launched in the evening when low-flying bombers were hard to pick out against the gathering darkness or the setting sun, as well as more normal bombing attacks which tended to occur mostly during the daylight hours. The toll exacted by the aerial attacks continued to rise. But the Australian ships, despite their largely inadequate anti-aircraft batteries, seemed to live charmed lives for the moment. Thanks in part to their efforts, over 45,000 men and women were evacuated to safety, albeit some of it turning out to be temporary. That temporary safety would prove to be the island of Crete, which was already dangerous enough for shipping with both the continued air assaults plus a steadily growing number of submarines and small attack boats, and then the German assault began in earnest at the end of May. Whilst the seaborne element of the invasion was almost entirely destroyed, something that often goes unreported in stories of the fall of Crete, this could not stop the mauled but still present paratroops from establishing a foothold and then slowly gaining the upper hand on the island itself. Voyager and Vendetta found themselves escorting the main battle fleet as it tried to cover the evacuation, whilst Stuart and Waterhen were a bit more up close and personal with the evacuation convoys themselves. Vampire at this point was running supplies to and from Tobruk, and her engines were misbehaving again. Once again, all the Australian destroyers managed to avoid damage, but by the end of May it was quite clear that Vampire's machinery needed major work and so she was sent via Suez to Singapore, bowing out of the Mediterranean story of the Scrap Iron Flotilla. Thus began the last chapter of the Valiant Formation. Their next and final service in the Mediterranean was to be the Tobruk Ferry Service, running supplies of all kinds to the besieged port, and coming back with the wounded. The pattern being to load up at night, leave Alexandria earlier in the morning, thus allowing them to approach Tobruk in the evening and arrive around midnight. Then it was a short journey part way back to exchange the wounded for more supplies, then a second night in Tobruk, and then the long run back to Alexandria. The ships assigned to this were the ones of the 10th Destroyer Flotilla, which included the four remaining Australian ships. And the operations were soon being done in pairs, both to improve the available anti-aircraft defences and to allow one ship to pick up survivors from the other, should one of them be sunk. One crewman explained it thus. We leave Alex in the early morning. All yesterday afternoon and last night we loaded stores and ammunition, pushing and lifting and packing until our backs ached. Number one made us shift everything just where he wanted it so that our trim wouldn't be upset, and it took us about eight hours to get everything into place. And we have to unload it in a quarter of that time. 
By the time we turned in for our last few hours sleep for two days, the deck was littered with every kind of store. Ammunition for field guns, anti-tank guns and light weapons, explosives, boxes of carefully packed detonators, landmines, great sacks of vegetables, boxes of oranges, tins of everything from oil to peaches, as well as rifles, machine guns and medical dressings. Uh, we went by ourselves. There's not much room for manoeuvring into Brook Harbour these nights, what with bombs and wrecks and the pitch blackness of the night. Besides, the jet aim may have been bombed before we got there, and then we'd have to dump everything into lighters. Well, sometimes we were bombed long before we reached to Brook, but this time we were lucky, and we were well down toward the port by dark. It was nearly full moon this night, and that made things worse. Jerry sometimes attacks at night, and I always thought night bombing was worse than everything else. In daylight, you can just see where he is. But at night you have to guess, and I always guessed he was right overhead. And sure enough, he came over this night. The moon was just made for bombing, and it seemed to rise earlier than usual. I heard the old man curse it pretty fluently, and when I went aft and saw our glistening white wake trailing out for a few hundred yards, I agreed with him. Looking over the side of the ship, I could see the phosphorescence gleaming just as if a scuttle had been left open, and the light was streaming out onto the water. There seemed to be two bombers, and this night they came in for their first attack with their engines flat out. Sometimes they cut their motors a few miles away and just glide down. Then the first you know about them is that bombs crash into the water alongside with a crump and the old ship shudders and shakes from stem to stern. We could hear the bombs whistling down and they exploded just on our starboard quarter. But the old man's been dodging bombs for a long time now and we began to zigzag as soon as the planes were heard. They made three or four attacks and then left but we knew they'd be back with their friends to try and stop us into Brook itself. Father had taken her pretty close to the shore, and we could easily pick out the escarpment. There were a lot of soldiers on deck, and they began to get fidgety as soon as they knew we were getting close. They haven't been to Brook before. We had. We're not as keen to get alongside as we used to be. The pilot picked out the narrow channel by some means known only to himself. We couldn't see it. All hands were on deck, of course, and the swaddies had pinched in, pinched all the good spots alongside the guardrails to get their first look at the town. Well, we were more interested in the wrecks. San Giorgio was just inside, and there were about 40 other hulks. There'd only been 27 when we arrived the first time. I think we used to get a chart showing any new wrecks, but we never knew if a ship had been sunk whilst we were at sea, so the lookouts were pretty keen. We were down to about four knots by this time, and twisting through the passage between the hulks to go alongside what remained of the wharf. Some of the swaddies went ashore before we'd properly secured, but, as I said before, they hadn't been there before. There was a bit of a fire on the end of the wharf, and we were told that a bomb had hit about half an hour before we arrived. Now, that didn't cheer us much. By the time the last soldier leapt ashore with all his gear, all the lashings were off the stores and some food was going over the side. The food was landed first because it was on top, and then all the jimmies, carefully stowed ammunition, started to go. The hands formed a chain to the ship's side, and the boxes were moving smartly when Jerry arrived again. You should have seen the activity then. Ammunition simply flew over the deck. The bombers knew where we were, too, and their eggs fell not far away. One hit the superstructure of a partly submerged hulk, and a fire started. We all cursed the so-and-so, for the moon was bright enough without any artificial illumination. We didn't fire back at the bombers, of course. That would just be asking for it. It's a bit galling, too, because you can't see them, although you know that they can spot you. And my idea of fun and games isn't lying alongside a jetty piled high with explosives when Jerry's dropping 500-pound eggs round the place, especially when there are still a few landmine shells and detonators on deck waiting to be unloaded. Down aft, we embark the wounded. Most of them had arrived on stretchers this night, and some of them were badly hurt. We laid the stretchers out on the mess decks, on the mess deck tables, on the deck, and even on the gun platforms. There were more than a hundred of them, and there were about two hundred walking wounded as well. They sat round anywhere they could find room. We gave them cigarettes, since it was a long time since they'd had a decent smoke. Someone was yelling out for mail, and soon they were dragging bags out of the mess decks. Sailors are always careful with letters, because they appreciate them too, I suppose, and the mail bags are unofficially considered important cargo. Jerry was still flying about, but the 3.7s put up a pretty fierce barrage and the bombs didn't fall so regularly or so close. The last cases of ammunition were manhandled over the side and we were ready to sail by 2.30. It had been bad enough trying to avoid walking into the boxes on the way up, but I could see it would be almost impossible to get from the forecastle to the quarterdeck without treading on someone. There were stretchers everywhere. Doc went around having a look at each case, giving those who needed it a shot of morphia to put them to sleep.
The sick berth Tiffy had a party of stretcher bearers with him and the way they looked after those soldiers was wonderful. We had a lot of bad cases this particular night. Legs and arms missing and a number horribly burnt. Jerry's flamethrowing tanks are being used more than they used to be. And at last we sailed. Most of the bombers had cleared off, but the nightly artillery duel had begun and we could see the flashes of our guns on the perimeter. Sometimes it begins before we get away from the wharf, but it was our lucky night t tonight, apparently. As we moved along the coast, the flashes became more frequent. Patrols, stealing out from the perimeter, had discovered something and the gunners were giving it everything they had. It may have been another tank attack, because this is about the time that Jerry makes his effort to crack the defences. The wounded soldiers were watching the battle and drawing hard on their cigarettes. Some of them were crying, but I knew it wasn't pain alone that brought the tears. They had left a lot of good cobbers back there. During all this time, the Scrap Iron Flotilla would suffer their only Mediterranean loss. At the end of June, HMAS Waterhen and HMS Defender were making a run when they were attacked by 19 Stuka dive bombers. Ian had by this point transferred to the ship and recalls, well, I, I'd really like to do, a, uh, if I could, a, a story on the whole Tobruk story. Oh, sure. Like. Wherever you want to go. OK. Uh, the 10th destroyer flotilla was used constantly as the Tobruk ferry. There were lots of other flotillas, by the way. There were lots, probably another half a dozen or more. But we seemed to be used mostly as this Tobruk ferry thing. Now... How did that work? We had our fellows, our Ninth Div and so on guys, up in Tobruk defending it. We had, by the way, been in Tobruk on the way up uh, when our fellows first took it, and I'd, so I'd been in and out of Tobruk a number of times and walked around Tobruk and everything. But when the Germans came back and surrounded Tobruk for that six or nine months period of the famous Rats of Tobruk period, there was a necessity to keep our soldiers supplied with ammunition and stores and to bring out their wounded and sick. So there was this constant Tobruk ferry thing went on. So let me try and explain what was a Tobruk ferry run. Let's use Monday morning, nine o'clock as the start point, start time. Well, all day Sunday, the Egyptian labourers would load our ship with stores and they would stand and run in queues across. There were truck would come along with the stores on board. The jippos would line up and they oh, would... that's, that's you. That's me this time. We'll just pause for a second. Just yeah. finished talking about the um, Egyptians loading yeah. the... What they would do is they'd, they would set up a chant. I mean, they, did, they didn't work hard. They would set up a chant and they would say, it was rather go rather like this, take this box and pass it to your mate. Take this box and pass it to your mate, which would come out like wing ya wong wa wong wong wong, wing, and this would go on for hours and hours, and that's the way they would work. Well, all right, so you'd get the ship loaded, it would be covered, the decks would be covered with boxes of ammunition and stores, and you know what. So that would go on till Sunday evening. And sort of round about five or six in the morning on would come the soldiers who were going to the relief soldiers who were going up with us to Tobruk. So we would have perhaps, let's say, 150 of our own crew. We would have 100 or so soldiers relieving or going back to Tobruk. And we would have all the stores on board. So the ship was well and truly loaded down to the, we'd say, loaded to the gunnels. And off we would set. But before, over breakfast, we would switch on the radio and we would have Lord Haw Haw coming from Germany. And your voice would come over, calling HMS Stewart, calling HMS Stewart. We know you're leaving Alexandria at nine o'clock. We know you'll be off Bardia at four o'clock. Our bombers will get you. And this would come over every day. All right, so you'd set up at nine o'clock. And you'd cruise up the coast until about Bardia, which is, let's say, in terms, let's say 100 miles. Uh, and uh, then by four o'clock, you would come within range of the German Stuka bombers who were based in northern Libya, uh, around Bardia area. And from then on, it was bomb, bomb, bomb until dusk, dark. So you went flat out for the next couple of hours. You always worked in pairs, or we'd say you, we, 
we always worked in pairs, two destroyers, because it was a sort of 50-50 thing. Somebody got hit almost every time. So you hot-footed it towards Tobruk, being bombed for a couple of hours with as many as 30 or 40 Stukas at a time, and they came over right high, and they always came down in threes, one, two, three, one, two, three, forming up in literally a constant line coming down at you. They would come down to as low as a couple of hundred feet. They dropped their bombs, and your captains became very clever at lying on the deck of their bridge, watching each bomber as he came down, and judging which way to turn. So you'd, the captain would lie down and he'd say, Hard to starboard, stop port, which would swing his stern away from the bomb. Um, and you could see the bomb, you could see, and I'm doing this for the audience, I would not normally talk about this, but you could see the, the rivets in the bombs as they came down. They were that close. And they were, you know, they'd be some up to sometimes a thousand pounders, which would be quite a large lump of metal coming down at you. And these fellows would come down. And now they came down and, and we learned late. It took us a year or so to learn how to kill these guys because we, until we learned that the aeroplane coming down is his wing is acting in exactly the same fashion coming down as it does going along. In other words, there is a lift. So while the aeroplane's coming down, he's not really coming straight, he's being lifted this way. So as long as you keep your shots ahead of him, he flies into them. And so we learned to do that. And we began to shoot, shoot a few of them down on the way down. And the essence was that our gunners therefore had to remain cool and keep their shells going in the right direction. Um, and then, of course, as they pulled out of their dive, they were at their most vulnerable because they'd lost speed and they would cruise alongside, and I mean alongside 50, 100 yards out at about 200 feet. And as they went by, they would thumbs up. So we would thumbs up. And every now and again, we'd shoot one down. We'd say, yeah, beautiful. I mean, it's the stupid business of war. There's this guy thumbing up to you, you're thumbing up to him, and you shoot him and you kill him. And everybody says, you beaut. Um, well, back to the actual run. So that went on for a couple of hours in the late afternoon, and then it came dark, and then you went to Tobruk, uh, which was totally unlit and lots of wrecks, so... The navigator had a tricky job of getting in there, but they got very good at it, as people do. We worked always in the dark at night. Um, and you got into the book maybe at 10 o'clock at night, alongside, and from then on in it was go, 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 because you had to get all those stores off, you had to get the soldiers off, the soldiers back on again, and get the hell out of it. Because while you were in there, is the Germans had the German out gunners out on the beyond the perimeter had the range, and provided the winds and weather were right, they could hit you. So it was a case of get in, get out quick, uh, and get away. So you'd go out, and in the morning, of course, you'd get bombed again, and you'd go back to uh, to Mercer Matru on the way back, where they had lots and more stores, and you would land the soldier wounded and and reliefs, and you would load up again with stores, and you'd set off the next afternoon and go through it again. And then at 10 o'clock at night, you'd be into the brook, you'd go through it again. Then you'd come back to Alexandria flat out. So it was Monday, Monday night, Tuesday, Tuesday night, Wednesday, you'd be back into Alexandria. And then you would get all night leave, which to a sailor was absolute privilege, because leave was normally till 10 o'clock in the evening. So you got all night leave and you had perhaps a day or so spell in Alexandria if you're lucky and off you went to end. Now I did something like 25 of those trips. <laughs> and of course on one of them was when Waterhen was sunk. I happened to be a relieving, because I was available as a relieving signalman therefore. Um, and back to that, why did I serve on all those VNWs? Because when Stuart was bombed at one time and, and blew off two-thirds of her rudder. 
We went through the Battle of Mattapan, where Stuart played a major part, and we've come back and said it's a fascinating story. We went through that battle with only one third of its rudder left. And she had to go into dock. Well, when she went into dock, of course, Captain Heck Waller had to move to another destroyer with his staff. And I happened to be his staff signalman. So I went with him on each one of those destroyers as the staff signalman. He took with him uh, his signal yeoman, that was a commissioned signalman, and, and a yeoman, that was a senior signalman, a petty officer signalman, and a staff signalman. And I was lucky enough to be the staff boy. So I moved around. And then uh, when Waterhen lost a signalman sick, they said, uh, right, oh, MacDonald, whip over to Waterhen for a few days and replace that guy. So over I went to Waterhen. Of course, the bloomin' Waterhen got sunk on the way to Brook. To Brook. Um, so Waterhen was sunk by Stuka dive bombers. Fortunately, the first bomb that hit us... Um, I seem to remember went through the quarter deck and bust the steering quadrant so that she was unable then to dodge. Uh, there is a final story, Italian, don't let me forget it. Uh, we couldn't dodge, so therefore the last bomber, I think it was, of the group landed a bomb right smack alongside us and blew a hole, which is in the photographs, but... It was probably about five metres long by a couple of metres, this hole, and that meant that the uh, engine room, or yeah, it would be the engine room of Waterhen, promptly flooded. Fortunately, all the guys got out, but Waterhen was therefore completely flooded and absolutely non est. So, no, there wasn't panic. There was, there was panic in a sense of, hello, we've got to cope with this. There wasn't panic in the sense that people lost their heads, not at all. Never was. People grabbed their life belts or made sure their life belts were on. You usually wore them anyway. Uh, made sure that the uh, boats were freed uh, and that the carly rafts were ready to toss over the side. Remember, we've got 150 or so extra soldiers on board. Signalman and the ship's heeling over because he'd been flooded and the water had gone in that side and over the ship went. Well, the first thing to do, therefore, is to chuck everything off that side to get the weight off it. So everybody pitches in chucking stuff, all this lovely stores and ammunition overboard, and the ship promptly goes back the other way. So the next task is to throw it all off that side. So when you look at the picture that's there, this is when the fellows are either preparing the, 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 the lifeboats and life rafts or chucking stuff overboard or wondering what the hell is going to happen. During all this, while well, this is all happening, um, I suddenly thought, hell, what about all my photographs are all down below in the mess deck? I'd better go down and get them. And as I mentioned earlier, I think that, you know, what a stupid thing for a bloke to do. But we were young and silly anyway. So I, off I sat down to the mess deck down below the water line with the sinking ship to get my blooming photographs. Thank God I got them because we've still got them. I got down because everything's dark and everything's rather like you took this room and turned it upside down and all the furniture was in a heap in the middle. Well, where was my case among all the others? Well, I floundered around uh, and... A gruesome little thing happened. I, the water was there about a foot or so deep, sloshing backwards and forwards, and in the dark suddenly something slimy landed against my leg, and I was horrified, and I leaned down thinking, oh my God, and it was a loaf of bread. I reached out in the dark and I put my hand on and I felt the texture of the leather of my case of all the dozens. So I grabbed it and I got it back and up, up top. Then um, we decided, or the captain decided, and his officers, that our other partner, destroyer, defender, was still quite safe and still around. Uh, so they decided that the best thing to do, Waterhen was still floating, 
but slowly sinking, that we would be able to transfer without even getting our feet wet, which we did, because Defender came along, stuck her bows alongside ours, and then we lashed the bows together, and we just walked across. And I've got pictures of that. I think they've been published. They have been published worldwide, actually. Because <laughs> um, I'm taking pictures all this time, being an avid photographer. <laughs> I ran the photo firms. I got paid for it. <laughs> um, so we came aboard Defender. Well, poor Defender had left Alexandria with 150 crew, a hundred or so soldiers, stacks of ammunition. Now she's got a hundred and fifty crew from Waterhen, a hundred sailors, uh, soldiers, and the, she's somewhat dead in the water. She's like a flat barge and can't move. So we leave Waterhen and we go away. Wondering, I guess, wondering what to do. Barely two weeks later, when in company with Vendetta, it was Defender's turn to be sunk. But as time went on, the remaining three Australian vessels gradually began to give out. They'd not been in the best of condition to start with, and they'd been run hard for almost three years, pretty much constantly. Voyager had to bow out in July, heading for Sydney for refit, followed by Stewart in August, heading for Melbourne, with only one working engine, and finally Vendetta in October. Having suffered minimal casualties throughout the Mediterranean campaign, even Wardhan's loss was attended by only a single wounded man, and that from a can of bully beef that the blast had blown across a compartment, the Australian detachment had acquitted themselves admirably. Perhaps it's best summed up by the introductory paragraphs to the book Scrap Iron Flotilla, written by Sub-Lieutenant John Moyes, who was present with the ships for their service in the Mediterranean. It reads as follows. Nazi propaganda minister Goebbels called them scrap iron. He welcomed them to the Mediterranean that bleak, cold December of 1939 as a consignment of junk and Australia's scrap iron flotilla. He ridiculed their fighting power, scoffed at their age and their infirmities. Of course, there was a germ of truth to his statement. They were old, and they weren't very big, or very fast, or very powerful. They'd been laid down and completed in 1918 when ships were slow and aircraft still in their infancy. And as Herr Goebbels looked out at the fast, deadly planes of the Luftwaffe and at the speedy modern ships of the Italian fleet, perhaps his derision was justified. But these five had been built by the men of the Clyde, whose fathers and forefathers had built ships for war and ships for peace that were the finest in the world. And they flew that proud white ensign that dips for no man or nation except in honour. They were manned by seamen who scorned danger, who would cheerfully steam into battle against any odds, and who thought only of victory. For two years they fought, and when they steamed away from the Middle Sea, they left behind a score of sunken submarines, scarred and battered cruisers and destroyers, and the mangled remains of some of the Luftwaffe's finest machines. They defied Italian battleships at Calabria and heavy cruisers at Matapan. They ran the gauntlet of every type of bomber as they plucked troops from the Nazis' grasp in Greece and Crete. They ran up and down the African escarpment at will, striking the enemy with their admittedly somewhat small guns. Goebbels called them scrap iron. Admiral Cunningham, in a message read to, the Aust to Australia's House of Representatives, commented, Nobody will appreciate the scrap better than the officers and men of the Australian destroyers. Australia was proud of these ships. They were her first contribution to the Empire's armed might. Long before the first troop ships left with the men who were to make their own lightning war in Egypt and Libya, the five little destroyers had sailed without fuss or farewells or bands or streamers, and three months after war was declared they were in the battle arena. They pitted their strength against an opponent whose ships were faster and bigger and more modern than they were, and they left him beaten. They suffered losses during those long months of constant battle, they were scarred, their time-worn engines were strained almost beyond their limits, but they shirked no fight, avoided no action. Their names were HMAS, Stuart, Voyager, Vampire, Vendetta and Waterhen. Vampire and Voyager would subsequently be lost in action against the Imperial Japanese Navy, whilst Vendetta, converted into an anti-aircraft escort, would survive the war, as would Stuart, who would conduct convoy escort missions until late 1943, after which she was used as a transport. This video was made possible with the kind assistance of the History Guild, a project commemorating the service by Victorians in the Mediterranean theatre of World War II was created by History Guild and is supported by the Victorian Government and the Victorian Veterans Council. 
Links to their work and the extensive database of veteran interviews from which this video has drawn can be found in the description below. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.